My name is Corrosive. I'm an artist, a streamer, and sometimes I make YouTube videos. How did I start using the internet, and how do I feel it has affected my life? Well, uh, I started using the internet actually at a pretty early age, like around, oh, I'd say around five years old when I was in school. It's when I started first really using it. Like I've known about it for longer, like since I was two or three, because my mom would use it. And she'd tell me not to use it. And so I wouldn't because I was a good boy. But when I was five, I started using it because we did it stuff in computer class. And they would teach us how to use the, you know, the internet and all that. The, the only the way I'd do sometime is uh, my mom was an art teacher. And she didn't really have an office specifically or like her own classroom that much. So I'd go to the computer lab after school because I went to the same school that she taught at for a while. And I would play around on Lego.com and I would play all the Bionicle games and the uh, Shockwave Lego RC car game. And I'd play the hell out of it. And that's how I first was really introduced to the internet and I thought, oh, it's a place to like play games and find cool animation. It wasn't until later that I, I started using the internet to its full potential. I was like 14 or so and my buddy Corey in high school showed me Newgrounds and then I was introduced to Newgrounds and I made an account in 2012 I didn't upload anything until like way later, until after I got a computer and of my own and uh, art f software for actually drawing. But uh, I've, I've always been, I've always been drawn to the internet. And I think overall the internet has affected my life in a net positive, despite being a very pessimistic person and seeing a lot of things on the internet that make me question why. Uh, while we don't have another great flood or anything like that, uh, I, I think that the internet has been overall positive on my life as a whole. I made some great friends. Uh, I've gotten to stay in touch with friends that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to because of just distance and because like I, I just didn't really have a way to contact them in any other way besides the internet. Yo. Shout out to uh, you, Justin, and to you, Corey. Glad I'm still able to stay in contact with you two guys. And uh, it's helped me make friends with people that I never otherwise would have been able to. Uh, for example, I wouldn't have been able to be friends with you, Alistair, if the internet didn't exist. Uh, or my buddy Hanzo, who I've been talking to for over 10 years and uh, lives in Japan. So... Yeah, the, the internet's been a pretty good thing overall, and I'm glad that I've met some cool people using it. Uh, I got into creating art the same way most kids do. I just started drawing. That, that, that's literally it. Uh, I've been drawing ever since I can remember. I've drawn the walls as a kid, which is not surprising to anybody who's ever been or had a child. Uh, you know, kids just draw on stuff constantly, especially walls. Um, but my, my grandmother, uh, really encouraged me to keep doing art. She'd do different like arts and crafts things with me, like making, uh, making Play-Doh from scratch and then just making stuff out of that, doing paper crafts, things like that. My, my grandmother was really supportive of me doing art with a bunch of random activities uh, when I was a kid. I, I just kind of kept doing artistic things as I got older. The main thing I would do, though, is draw. And I've been drawing pretty, pretty often ever since I was a kid. But I started actually getting talent for things, like actually understanding how things look good when I was about eight. That's when I started really getting good at drawing, uh, I'd say. One thing I would draw all the time, because I was a huge fan of like Digimon and Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, was I would draw like dragons, but I'd give them like 
praying mantis arms and like a cyborg cannon on their back and like 37 wings or something like that. The crazy. Uh, they were always from, they, they were always flat though. I would always draw it like the, uh, like you were just seeing them from the side because I, I was, I was eight. And that's the best way for me to understand how to like do stuff like that back then was, was just design it on its side and figure that out. But I, I still had uh, people in my class that accused me of tracing. And I'm like, no, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not tracing. I made this up. Uh, and then one time, I, I proved it to them because I actually drew Billy from Billy and Mandy. Uh, and, and I got to look exactly like the cartoon. And I was like, see, I, I, I can actually draw. I just, I drew this one when I was bored. And, uh, yeah, I, I've just been kind of drawing ever since. Uh, when I went to church, they had these little notepads in the pews. And I would, I would make little trading cards and draw with those all the time. Uh, I, I would just constantly be drawing. I'd never stopped drawing. Yeah, that, that's how I got into creating art. And I just kept with it up to this point. It wasn't until uh, 2015, though when I finally got my own computer in the form of a gaming laptop that I actually started doing digital art though. I, uh, I'd always wanted to do digital art. I'd been begging for a computer ever since I was like 10. I wanted my own computer. Now that, you know, I, I had my own computer at that point. I, I also, uh, I kept working my job that I had and I got uh, manga studio and I got a drawing tablet uh, well my mom got a drawing tablet and she let me use it but I was really the only one that used it and so the, it just kind of took off from there I've, I've gone through like two other drawing tablets since then because at one point my, my program started messing up and I thought it was the tablet messing up. It wasn't. It was just the program being weird. And so my buddy Justin, uh, shout out to him, uh, on Christmas got me like a, a cheap drawing tablet that, that lasted me for a very long time. Uh, it, it was cheap, but it was good. And it, it was only like $60, but it was really, really good for that $60. At some point in uh, 20, 2020, I, I bought another drawing tablet, this time a, a Huion. And I've, I've been loving that, you know, it has a screen and all that. And that's been, that's been wonderful. I have considered getting another tablet since then because I've heard good things about other tablets, but right now this one's doing me fine. So I'm just going to keep going with it. I always wanted to do animation and I got like a DSI when I was like 14. So I started doing stuff through Flipnote and it was pretty bad, but I, I, I did stuff and then I didn't really have animation software until I got Clip Studio Paint EX. Uh, I, I got EX because it was on sale and because uh, I was still th dealing with that uh, manga studio issue with um, getting, the, getting the lines not to be weird and funky. So I, I just got bought completely new art software. I haven't really animated too much since then because of really bad ADHD, but I I want to do more with it. I'm going to do more with it. I, I've dabbled in 3D modeling, but I've never really stuck with it. I need to, like, actually focus and learn 3D modeling and get it down. It's just, I'm... I'm I'm dumb and I, I <laughs> when I want to do something, I know what I want to do with it. And I want to make a person or I want to make a monster. I don't want to make a stupid fucking donut. So I've never done the donut tutorial, but I've actually like done things with Blender. Cause like if I want if dude, if I wanted a donut, you know what I'd do? I'd go to <laughs> I'd go to fucking Dunkin' Donuts and I'd get a fucking donut. If I want to take a picture of a donut, I could take a picture of a donut. I want to make weird shit that doesn't exist or like creepy monsters or like anime stuff or whatever in 3D. 
but nah, I uh, that, that's basically my history with uh, all the forms of art that I've experimented with. Though I'd um, I actually I'd like to experiment with music as well. Uh, I'm just I've never played an instrument in my life really. Like I had a guitar as a kid, but it was an acoustic, and I didn't want to learn acoustic guitar. I wanted to learn electric guitar because I was I was a dumb kid. Now I'd be okay with either. I'd still prefer electric because of certain techniques you can do with electric that you can't do with acoustic. But being able to play both is uh, nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm considering getting more into music production too. Who decides the value and the meaning of an art piece? I'd say that the meaning of an art piece is decided solely by the artist when it comes to the piece's actual meaning. However, you can assign a piece your own form of meaning depending on how it's affected you or what you think it might be however it's never going to be actually the the true meaning of a piece the true meaning of a piece is always going to be with the artist and what the artist says and if we don't know what the artist says we'll never know the meaning and we just have to live with that we can speculate all we want we'll never know the actual answer you might have a piece where it's like I feel like this was, I feel like this was really trying to, the the artist trying to channel his his inner pain. I feel like this was the artist trying to let loose his emotions of frustration and anger, and like the actual meaning could just be, you know, I just wanted to like draw, you know, like cool fire and demons and hell, and, and like that could literally be it. We don't know because the guy could be dead, or he might not want to say, because part of marketing art is letting people assign their own meaning to shit and then hoping they buy it based off of something stupid like that which gets you know into the subject of the value of an art piece value of an art piece the emotional value i say it's worth a whole lot more to me than the monetary value the value of a piece is determined by the asshole that tells the artist to make the piece and then by the idiot who bids on it. And that, that's how it goes when it comes to modern art, like gallery art, where like people actually do active bidding and stuff. That's how that gets made. Uh, you have a manager that tells you what to do and then you make it and then you, whatever. Or like you have a manager and then they, they see your piece and you're like, hey, do you think like people buy this? And he's like, I don't know, try something different, and yeah, it, it's fucking dumb, and I hate it. I hate modern art. I hate modern art so much. I hate how the money aspect has become more of the thing than the actual quality of the art. Like the stupid fucking banana tape to a wall. I know that's not the most recent stupid thing, but it's the one that's in everyone's mind because I don't think it acts... Like, you might be trying to make a statement or something... It, probably not you're doing it for the publicity because you knew it would you know make fucking waves in the media if i wanted a banana dude and i wanted it taped to the wall i could spend like five bucks go to walmart buy a banana buy duct tape and tape it to my own damn wall if i really felt like it you know there, there's no skill in that whatsoever no skill I don't know who made that. I, I don't give a shit about looking it up because they're going to be remembered for that one piece and then nothing ever again. They're never going to have accomplished anything in art aside from a stupid fucking banana. There are literally times where people will go to art galleries and they'll be like, how much is this piece? And it's literally a knocked over garbage can. And it's like, no, no, like that's not an actual piece. Someone accidentally knocked over a garbage can in the gallery area. That has actually happened. And I fucking despise quote unquote art people. The only good piece I can think of is when Banksy did a painting on canvas. And then after the piece was sold, the painting automatically shredded half of itself just to say, fuck you. <laughs> that was the best modern art piece I've seen. I'm not sure if a lot of things can top it. I'm not a fan of modern art and how people assign value to it monetarily. But I think that how an art piece affects you emotionally and how it affects you, maybe even spiritually, depending on who you are, 
I think that says a lot more to me about your taste in art than the value of something in terms of money. Like for me, uh, I highly value, I highly value the works of Francis Bacon. Some of his later works was more disturbing works. I really enjoy those. And then I also really enjoy the, the works of, uh, Masahiro Ito and, and Junji Ito. I really enjoy their art a lot. Junji Ito has, has some great art, great stuff he can do with just a pen. Uh, Masahiro Ito, uh, takes a lot of inspiration from Francis Bacon and does a lot of creepy stuff with it. And I'm a really big fan of it. Yeah, that, that, that's how I feel about the, the value of art and the meaning of art. Are there some things that other people consider bad, but you personally enjoy? If at least in terms of, well, like in terms of games, there's not many I can think of. I play a few kusoge or like shit games when it comes to fighting games, uh, like Fist of the North Star or uh, Waku Waku 7. Those have an audience of people that like them. And that's, that's pretty important to, is to realize that I, I do know groups of people that like that thing. Like with games, it's a lot harder for me to find something I don't like or it's harder for me to find something that i like that other people don't like than for me to find something that other people like that i don't like because with games at least your ability to play it is one of like the dri main driving factors so if it doesn't control well no one's gonna like it i will say though that there's one aspect of controls in games that i do like that other people don't like and that's tank controls in horror games. I do like them in, in Silent Hill. So that's one aspect that some people consider kind of bad, but I, I personally don't. I also think that the voice direction in Silent Hill 2 is absolutely perfect. Some people say that the voice acting in that is bad. And I'd say, I'd counter argue and say, no, if you've heard it, and you realize what's going on, it's that everyone is slightly off and it's creepy that everyone is slightly off. And that's what makes it good. It's obviously intentional with the vocal direction that it's not quite right, that everyone is slightly creepy. That's, that's the point, it's a horror game. It's like Twin Peaks or something, you know, it's just not everyone's quite there. And it's important to say Twin Peaks because Twin Peaks was was really 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 big in Japan. A lot of pe like a lot of people in games have been heavily inspired by Twin Peaks. Like Swery, shout out to Swery, he's great. He made a Deadly Premonition, and that that obviously has a ton of influence from Twin Peaks. But most most game like even then, people agree that Silent Hill Two is fantastic, even if there are certain parts they don't like. And that might just be because they don't understand a certain aspect or because they don't like the feeling of the tank controls, which is understandable. However, when it comes to, when it comes to anime, <laughs> when it comes to anime, there are some shows that I like that other people despise. Now people have started to see this show in the same way that I do over time, but the anime school days, I think is a fantastic piece of anime, a fantastic work, an adaptation of a visual novel. And that visual novel has some endings. It has some endings. All right. It's got some, it's got some endings. School days goes from being generic to going with one of the more interesting endings and ends up becoming a deconstruction of a subgenre of romance anime that you never thought it would be. I don't want to spoil any more about it whatsoever because I want people to actually watch it or to play the School Days visual novel. I think it's subversive and genius. When it comes to music, there are things that I like that other people will hate. They'll absolutely hate. So I like, I like, I like grindcore. And nobody likes grindcore really unless you're like really, really into heavy harsh music and I like I like gore grind and porno grind and all that because it's really it, it offends 
And I like when something challenges people's sensibilities. And the one I know that offends people more than anything is anal cunt. Anal cunt. It's literally like the most offensive name they could think of. They have horribly offensive songs that like, <laughs> you're going to have to bleep these out because of how, how terrible they are. Like the, the naming conventions are terrible and the music th itself is, is literally Seth Putnam screaming his head off. Like his vocal cords sound like they're going to die. The, like the instrumentation is, is really, really shit because they're just playing as fast and as hard as they can, but it's in a good way. I, I think it's good. Okay, so one, one song that Anal Cut that, that you, you, you're going to have to bleep this out is You Were Too Ugly, So I Just Beat the Shit Out of You. Uh, another one was, you, don't pro you probably don't have to bleep this one out. I'm going to give you AIDS. That, that, one, that one's bad. They've got uh, Chris Barnes is a pussy. You're a fucking cunt. <laughs> you're pregnant, so I kicked you in the stomach. When I think of true punk rock bands, I think of Nirvana and the Melvins. It, not a, an offensive one, but you know, people, people get mad at that one. You're gonna have to bleep this one out. You rollerblading, recycling is gay. <laughs> if you don't like the village people, you're gay. All our fans are gay. You're going to have to bleep this one out. Cop calling. F and, and then they, they turn it all around and release the album Picnic of Love, which is all sung in a terrible falsetto. So like really soft, gently played acoustic guitar. And it's got songs like I Respect Your Feelings as a Woman and a Human. It's got songs like Saving Ourselves for Marriage. It's just stupid shit like that. And then and then and then Seth Putnam is like I was watering my rose garden when you came out and said ba -da -da -da. it's like that the entire album and it's beautiful and there's no cursing whatsoever and the only reason the entire album has an explicit label on it is because of the band logo and the band name even though they only put AC on the album uh it, it's it's pretty much the logo that they chose that, that that gets it the explicit rating that that's one thing that i i like that other people won't like and i understand it, it's literally seth putnam being edgy for the sake of being edgy to offend literally everybody that exists rest in peace seth putnam or rest in piss whichever you prefer i, I like a lot of punk rock especially like hardcore punk rock and I know that's very divisive among people. I think the importance of stat of challenging the status quo or of challenging what the majority of people think is right and sensible and what they think is in good taste is, is pretty important. And that's that's why I like a lot of punk rock and really like typically offensive to most people music. In terms of movies, I, it, it's funny. I feel like I should have recorded this after I do this, but I haven't seen it yet, but I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch Freddy Got Fingered because I've heard it, it's actually genius. I, I have nothing to say on it currently at this moment. I do know that people hate it though. Uh, even my buddy Alex on the Streaming Into the Ethernet podcast watched it and he absolutely despised it. I'd say the environment greatly affects the creative process and your environment is not just limited to what you are surrounded by physically, but the people you're surrounded by and your mental state. I'd say that I, I need to improve my environment Work on uh, making it where I have less distractions. I need to like turn off the internet when I draw 
and just have all my songs downloaded and just listen to them. I already have them all downloaded. I just got to turn off the internet on my computer and just draw. Because I have really bad ADHD. But I, I'd say that not only does the physical environment you draw in affect you, the people you surround yourself with will. Because the different experience, more experiences you have with people, the better art you're going to be able to make unless your piece is about solitude. Even then, you need to surround yourself with people at some point afterwards so that way you can make a contrasting piece or be able to draw upon those feelings of solitude in retrospect and be able to really bring something out about it. Like if you want to make a piece about solitude, that is completely fine and I understand that, but you do need to have you do need to have real friends. That's a very important thing. The people that you can visit laugh with you know hit when they're being stupid idiots you know hug get hit by when you're being a stupid idiot and so I'm, I'm really appreciative of my IRL friends for being there for me and helping my artistic environment my creative environment to improve in that way I think though that your your mentality, your emotions also affect the creative process. I have major depressive disorder. You don't have to take this out or anything. I I don't mind admitting it. I just don't advertise it about myself on my Twitter bio cuz I'm not a fucking cunt. Uh <laughs> and I don't like exploiting my mental illness for the sake of cash. I do have major depressive disorder. And so that does sometimes become a part of my creative pieces, mostly within my writing, though. I don't really draw too many things that are sad or dark or anything like that. Most of the stuff I draw is I'm trying to be funny or I'm trying to draw something cool or I'm trying to draw a cute girl, something like that. But my writing really does get affected and really does go into darker, darker tones and, and darker moments, I'd say. I think that if you're making, you, you can make a lot of really dark things sometimes, but you, you do need to make your emotional uh, environment a positive one from time to time. So that way you can really remember the happy times or enjoy some happy times. And not just dwell on the evil in the world and the disgusting. Uh, because there, there is good in the world, I, I'd like to think. As pessimistic as I am, as much as I hate, as much as I hate people as a whole, I do think there are, I do know that there are good people out there and there are, you know, good things about the world. And I think that we need to try and focus on those things to be healthy, and that will help our creative process is not to dwell too much on the negative. Draw, on, uh, draw upon negative emotions for sure. Those are very powerful emotions that can make some very, very striking and emotionally connecting art for a lot of people. It, it is for me, but I, um, a lot of my, my drawing, I, I haven't really tapped into the negative sides of myself yet I, I really should i just feel like i can't properly convey that with my skill set um but yeah ha keep you uh ha have friends around uh make make sure that you, the workplace you're in is that your workspace is suitable for creating and uh, enjoy life if you're having trouble with with writing, I'd say. If you have a chance, I'm going to say this. Get a boring job. Work at a McDonald's or work at a factory or work in retail. Because it will help you in the long run. You're going to be forced to think of things that you wouldn't otherwise have thought about and you're going to get bored and you're going to want to escape and so what you're going to do if you're me is you're going to create things in your head and you're going to think of new ideas 
uh, and that that's a good that's a good uh, advice I have for writers. My uh, my buddy Justin, one of the best writers I know, you know personally at least, that's what he does. He he's worked boring jobs, and it's helped him create some of his best art, some of his best written works. That's my advice for writers: work a boring job. And then you'll have a reason to be creative and you'll have a reason to want to write. Which pieces of media have made you cry? When I was a very young boy, up, up until like the age of, of like 14, a lot of things made me cry from being scared because I was a giant pussy. I didn't cry during the theater, but uh, Monster House, I saw that when I was like 10 years old in theater. And when I went home uh, at night, I cried because I was scared. Again, massive, massive pussy as a child. My mom wanted to pull me out of the theater because she knew I'd be scared by it. And I'm like, no, mom, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I, I can watch this. I'm, 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 I'm a big boy now. Let's see. Uh, when I was very young, I refused to watch Monsters, Inc. When I was like six. Because it had monsters and it was about the monsters in the closet. And I was I was absolutely terrified of just the concept. It's like with it's like with normal people and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They don't ever have to watch the movie. The name enough is going to scare them and is going to conjure the most brutal images in their head. And that's what Monsters Inc. did for me when I was six. <laughs> Since then, though, not nothing has made me cry of, from being scared ever. Uh, horror is one of my favorite genres, and the the game I'm currently working on with some some friends is a horror game. Uh, my favorite pieces of media are, <laughs> well, I mentioned it earlier: Texas Chainsaw Massacre from the 1970s, Silent Hill 2. Silent Hill 3 is also great. I think Silent Hill 3 and 4 are scarier than 2, but I prefer 2's story. But yeah, I love horror now, so I don't really get scared of things anymore. I, I will jump at certain things because, duh, it, it's engineered in a way to make to take advantage of fight or flight. Like, I don't like Outlast because of that. But nothing's made me cry from being scared since I was a very young child. Uh, or since I was like a kid. However, there are things that have made me cry since then. So I don't watch a whole lot of live action shows because I, I don't care. I don't care about live action that much. It's not interesting to me. There are some great actors, I will admit. And I do like watching some, I do like watching older movies. Like I said, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, Taxi Driver, things like that. But I, I have seen animation that has made me cry before. Tengen Topa, Gurren Lagan. I have watched that show since I was 15. Every year, I've done a yearly rewatch. I, I turned 27 this year. I've been watching it for 12 years. I've actually seen it, though, 14 total times. I, I've seen the entirety of the television series 12 times, and I've seen the entirety of the movie, uh, the movie adaptations twice. Tengen Topa, Gurren Lagann. Gurren Lagann makes me cry every single time for both sadness and happiness. Uh, there's multiple reasons it makes me cry, multiple points in the series and multiple points in the films. I, I will tear up. Uh, I, I'm not afraid to admit that. It's just a mixture of emotions for me. That, that series is something I watch when I, I need a pick-me-up. Uh, when, when I'm at my emotional low, I will watch that series. And sometimes I just watch it because I just want to watch it. That's why I've seen it more than one time a year. <laughs> and it, it gets me every single time. Or another, another show I've seen or whatever. 
that that made me tear up was a silent voice. Uh, it's an anime about a a deaf girl and the boy that used to bully her. They're older, and he realizes some terrible things he did as a kid and feels bad about them. And you should watch it. It's very powerful. It's got beautiful animation. I'm a huge fan of it. A lot, of, a lot of series have made me cry, and a lot of, a lot of stuff has made me cry for the the sappiest reasons. I've been reading shoujo manga and like romance manga since I was like 14. So a, a lot of, a lot of those, a lot of those can make me cry when they're good. I don't remember every single one of them. But this is actually a shonen romance manga that made me cry, and that is Bakuman. Bakuman is a manga about two guys making manga. And it starts when they're in like middle school, and then goes into high school, and then goes into college, and then after that, the illustrator wants to marry a girl, and the conditions are she said she would marry him if his manga gets turned into an anime and she gets to voice the main heroine that that manga made me cry that manga made me cry like a baby fun fact it's drawn and written by the same duo that made death note so yeah uh i did not expect to cry from a manga by the guys who made Death Note. That, that is not something I expected at, at, by a long shot. I have a playlist of depression music that I haven't really cried to very often. A few few things I've I've cried to in that playlist. Not not too many times. I'm I don't really cry that much in general. It's as much as I deal with depression. It's hard to get me to cry unless it's like a sappy emotional thing, in which case, yeah, it's still also hard to make me cry. I have to like actually know it really well or like I have to be really invested to actually cry uh, from something. But um, yeah, the, the song I Hate That You're Happy by Tiny Little Houses. Um, that that song makes me cry. That song definitely makes me cry. I, I've listened to the song I'm Fucking Alone by Harley Poe uh, a lot more than I expected to in the past year of finding it. And yeah, I haven't cried to it, but I, I listened to that song quite a bit. So yeah, there there's a lot of there's media that's made me cry. Uh, but it's been for different reasons, uh, whether it's be because it made me happy or because I'm really sad. Not a lot of things that made me cry from being like scared or whatever, uh, since I was like little at least. How do you process negative emotions? <laughs> I don't do that well. Probably because I deal with negative emotions constantly from my depression. I listen to really, I listen to my depression playlist, let things fester inside me. It's bad. And then with the moment that I'm able to, I will go and like read manga or watch an anime that I know is like a, a, a sappy love story or something to try and get some sort of escapism from my, my own misery. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, that, that's typically how I, that's how I process negative emotions. I deal with a lot of loneliness. Finding that escapist fantasy is what I, that's what I go for. I've always felt alone. I've always felt worthless. Uh, I've, I've always felt disgusting. Uh, it, it really, it's really kind of, you know, started since I was like 12 is when it really hit. <laughs> I, I I don't pr the 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 one emotion that I don't process well is sadness from being lonely. That's uh 
that's something I've been working on since forever. But sometimes it's just a bit too much to handle. Experiences I've had with fighting games. So, my life has been very, very, very video game centric. Ever since I was a little baby, I had educational games that I would play. Ever since I was a, you know, a, a little kid. Well, my, my grandfather had a PC that had emulators and ROMs on it somehow. I don't know how he got it, but he had like Neo Geo games. And so I, I'd, I'd button mash in like King of Fighters 98 or whatever. Or I'd button mash in uh, Fatal Fury, but I didn't know what the hell was going on. I, I was playing with a keyboard and I didn't know any better and I was dumb. And like two or three. But it wasn't until later when uh, I barely remember those. So I don't really consider those my first fighting games because I barely remember anything about them. I remember playing Sonic Spinball on PC more than I remember the fighting games I played. So I don't really consider the, those my first fighting game. The first fighting game I played because I played against an actual person and figured out what buttons did was Killer Instinct for the Super Nintendo. My, my great aunt. Uh, has a farm. My cousin had a Super Nintendo and I played Killer Instinct with him. I never beat him as a kid because, duh, I was a dumb kid. I didn't know how to do special moves or anything. And I didn't know that, oh, this does light, this does medium, this does heavy. I just pressed buttons and I, I played Cinder because I thought he looked cool and I always played Green Cinder because I thought he looked the best. That, that's the first time I really played a fighting game because I played it against somebody. And even though I kept losing to my cousin, I never got mad. I, I never got upset. Even though I was a very small child, you know what I got? I was excited. I was happy because I wanted to play again. So I, I've been able to handle losing with fighting games pretty well ever since I was, ever since I was a little boy. Then when I got into high school, one of the first friends I made was Corey. Again, shout out to my buddy Corey once again. And then he invited me to a place at the local uh, university that um, they would all go to on the weekends and play fighting games. I didn't own any of the consoles that we played on. I did not own a PS3 at the time or a 360. I owned a 3DS and a Wii, and that was it. And so I played fighting games and I lost constantly, but they taught me over time, hey, you do this motion, you do a quarter circle and then a punch to do a fireball. You do a backwards quarter circle and a kick to do a tatsu you kind of do a weird almost reverse fireball to make a dragon punch to do, you know to do a shoryuken and so i've been playing fighting games ever since then and then uh my second year of high school i i met justin and he he joined our group because he transferred from a different school and I, I became fast friends with Justin. And he was really good at fighting games. He, he was, I feel bad because he was so good that people would tell him to stop using his main because they couldn't beat him. And it got to where it wasn't fun for them. And uh, I only recently learned how that feels on a, on a couple Gooner Gang dreams. <laughs> because uh, one, one of my co-hosts does not handle losing well. And I'm going to make him learn that uh, he's got to learn how to lose and deal with it and be an adult about it. <laughs> no hard feelings, Matthew. <laughs> but um, I would play fighting games and I would lose a lot. I never really won too many times because I was just button mashing or I was barely learning how to like, tread water within the ocean that is fighting games. Then after high school, I got that gaming laptop, and one of the first things I did was get like Ultra Street Fighter 4. And I learned how to play that uh, a little bit. I, I, I dabbled with it. I didn't play it too much, but I dabbled with it. 
And then I found other fighting games. And then over time, I just, I, I, I had a, I had a falling out with Justin for a bit. Corey, Corey had moved, moved out of town, uh, gone somewhere else. Justin was still in town. And unfortunately, we had it. We had a bit of a, we had a bit of a falling out because of a, 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 a third party or kind of a second party. I don't know. A third party kind of screwed things up. And, and so we stopped talking. So for that time, I, I didn't really play fighting games until I, I hung out with my buddy Jay, who I met working at a store. Uh, I went to high school with him. I never really talked to him, though. I just, I just didn't because I wasn't a talkative person back in high school. And I became a more talkative person as I got older. Jay and I would hang out, and I taught him Killer Instinct. I showed, hey, dude, there's this game called Killer Instinct on Xbox, and it's really fun. Do you want to play? And he's like, hell yeah, dude, I want to play. And like he would play Thunder and I, I would play, I'd play Jago and I'd play, um, oh, TJ Combo. Then I later on got the game when it came out on Steam and, and I've, I've, I've been playing a lot since then, but it was actually shortly after I, um, after I, I started working with Jay and hanging out with him, I, I reconciled with Justin for a while. What we would do is every few days we would just hang out together and play fighting games. We, we would play fighting games a lot. We would play a lot of third strike back then, actually on my personal Twitch channel, we did some streams together where we would play fighting games together like uh, Street Fighter Alpha 2 and like Third Strike and stuff. And th those were cool times. And I, I enjoy those times. I miss those times. Eventually, we, we had another falling out because certain things weren't handled well. So I just kind of kept playing fighting games on my own a bit. I, I had been using Discord since then. Since before then, I've been using it since 2016, mostly to play GTA. But by then, I started playing games on like Fightcade and I started making friends on Discord that I'd play fighting games with until about, I would say, August of 2022 when I went to the local game store. And by local game store, I don't mean like a video game store. I mean a, a store that sells trading card games and board games. I went there on a whim after applying at a job somewhere. Eventually found my, my group of IRL friends again. You know, not again, but like I found a group of IRL friends. And I found people that play fighting games in that group, Matthew and Alex. Then in December of 2020, actually, no, in November of 2022, Alex works at a record store and the, the people that own it were like, Hey, yeah, you guys can like play fighting games here or whatever, when we're closed and, uh, stuff like that. And so we did for a bit. Uh, and then I was like, yo, what if we started a, a Twitch and we started streaming us playing fighting games like two days a week or something the the ongoing joke of the gooner gang uh started with me during a, during a game of golf a few yeah, a few months earlier and i'd say like in the september or so maybe october so, 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 like late september early october sometime around then and so we, we'd all been saying we were part of the gooner gang for a, a couple months by that point then I was like, yo, how about we turn this Gooner Gang shit into like an actual thing? And they're like, yo, that sounds dope. And, and so uh, we, we started the Gooner Gang, uh, the Gooner Gang Gamers Twitch. I'm actually thinking about changing that to Gooner Gang TV. But we started the Gooner Gang Gamers Twitch. And ever since December of last year, we've been playing fighting games and we've just been playing random fighting games, just 
games that we know, absolute kusuge shit games that we don't know a goddamn thing about, and then we learn about and we learn to love, and we make each other do eat disgusting things and do stupid shit as a penalty for losing. And we have casual, casual Fridays where we play games with the community that we've started developing uh, slowly. And um, it, it's been a lot of fun. Fighting games are something that I'm, I'm really passionate about. And I, I've wanted to make a fighting game since like 2014. We're, uh, we're having a good time doing the Gunner Gang stuff and, and doing these, these fighting game streams. And I hope that we can continue to grow and maybe even at some point organize tournaments uh things like that you know just start a big fighting game community within my area of the u.s it, it's been it's been fantastic hopefully sometime I'll, I'll enter a tourney uh i haven't entered a tourney since a smash tourney i entered forever ago that i did terrible at because i've never been good at smash bros i hope that we can get this to take off because so far Fighting games have been pretty fucking cool, and and I like them a lot. The sensibilities you grew up around and the culture of the people that you grew up around will greatly affect how you're going to see something. It, it's going to be things like, oh, this is this is too lewd. It's it's degenerate, you know, things like that, or this is too violent. You know, that those those are some basic things that will affect your sensibilities. Um, I'm kind of a weird case because I, I'm white. <laughs> I'm white, despite despite what I've been told about saying, you know, people telling me that I, I look Asian. It's it's interesting because I've, I've grown up with anime since I was a very young boy, since even before Toonami started airing in ninety nine. I I was born in 96 per perspective. I I've been watching Speed Racer from the 1960s and like Astro Boy from the 1960s from videos, VHSs we'd rent. Like my dad was like, "Oh yeah, you're going to love Speed Racer. I I grew up with that." And I did. I grew very close to anime in in terms of the art style. How, how really it's like the first pieces of media I really consumed seriously are what really shaped my perception of media since then. Because when I was growing up is when a lot of Japanese media was coming to the West. Like for the first time really, like in mass, like being on TV and things like that in a way that was a bit more true than, you know, 60s, 60s Astro Boy or 60s Speed Racer. The, I, I never really had a, a super strong connection to anything culturally in my area when I was a kid. I, um, I just never did. It, it was more of the fiction I consumed that I was close to and the people I knew that I was close to. I was, I was raised Christian. And so that religious background has actually had more influence on me than any cultural background because I'd, I'd watch, I'd watch anime or I'd watch or, or I'd play a game that made a reference to something within the Bible that really struck me as odd. And I'm like, why is, why is this Bible thing in this robot show uh why why is this here and even though i've i've stopped being religious really and i have stopped being a, a really a spiritual person i still have those that religious background that affects me and it's made me appreciate certain media more like with uh the megaten franchise with like shin megami tensei and persona and other games um i've been i've been drawn to that because of my religious background because regardless of my, the religion i grew up with i've always been interested in other religions and like how they believe certain things that line up with our with, with other beliefs like how so many religions so many cultures have like this this notion of a great flood uh and things like that 
So the religious background has been a lot more important to me than the cultural background. But that might just be a consequence of being white in America. Uh, specifically being in a redneck area where I, I'm not a redneck. I, I didn't grow up on a farm. I didn't go hunting as a kid or anything like that. Being raised a Christian made me appreciate certain media in a different way. Even if I'm not a Christian anymore, just because um, it's like, hey, this is this is like a reference to this certain thing in this religion and things like that. So, so yeah, I'd say, I'd say depending on where you're from, your, your cultural background will, will affect your perception of media just because it affects your common sensibilities. But for me, it was more about my religious background than my cultural background. I'd say there are some movies I'm going to recommend. I'm going to recommend Taxi Driver. It's great. It's fantastic. King of Comedy. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock. Halloween by John Carpenter. Oh yeah, Jacob's Ladder. Eraserhead. You may notice that most of those are horror, or in some way, they're, they're all fairly dark, and that's because I like dark movies. And dark media is, is what I like. It's what I can connect with personally. I don't really watch too many live action movies. Actually, there's one more I'm going to recommend clerks, but clerks is, is a special one for me because it hit me at the right time in the right place. I, I was working at a gas station at this time. I was working at a convenience store. I was 22 and my girlfriend was telling me to get back into college. It was on Netflix. I saw clerks and it hit me hard. <laughs> it was exactly the stuff that I was going through pretty much basically beat for beat my life experience at that time except for playing hockey on a roof because I'm not really a hockey guy uh, other than that I don't really watch too many too many live action movies that aren't horror or like a a classic film that people have recommended to me because they think I'll like it just because I just I have a harder time connecting to a movie than I do a series of like a TV series because you don't spend as much time with the characters unless it's like some sort of massive thing like Avengers or whatever where where or you know Marvel where all these characters and stuff are all interconnected and that was just tiring I just did not care about Marvel after like I don't know the first Avengers it was kind of cool and I saw the second Avengers and it was like all oh, right and then like eventually I was just like oh my god just please shut the fuck up but th those aren't movies I recommend I'll recommend Iron Man because I, I love you know I love that movie because I love the character, uh, and I, I loved Iron Man as a comic book character before I loved loved the uh, movie character. That's that's the only Marvel movie I'm gonna recommend. <laughs> you, the rest are are just everyone's already seen it or whatever, and like the, everyone's seen Iron Man, I'm pretty sure. But you know I'm just, I'm still gonna say it because I I like it. I think that it stands up on its own, and that's what's important about it. The rest of the things I'm going to recommend in terms of TV shows and movies are, are anime. I know that not everyone's into that. I am. So shut the fuck up and deal with it. Uh, so I'm going to recommend Perfect Blue. It's by Satoshi Kon. It's a highly disturbing film that really captures the scary parts of online celebrity in a time before online celebrity was really a Thing. This is a movie from the 90s and it captures what internet people, like internet famous people, actually deal with better than a lot of other things do. And it's terrifying and it's fantastic and it's disturbing and I love it. Perfect Blue, watch it. Uh, I'm also going to recommend Redline. Uh, Redline is a gorgeous. Gorgeous, 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 gorgeous movie. If it gets a 4K remaster, I'm going to buy that. If it gets an 8K remaster, I'm going to buy it. Wh whatever, I'm going to watch Redline in the best quality that I can. Uh, if you ever needed to see a movie that will sell you that hand-drawn animation is the coolest 
form of art ever than watch Redline. Uh, I just, I just, I love Redline so much. It's so good. It's a, it's a dumb popcorn film, but the visuals and the music are just so amazing that like you just have fun with it the entire time. I'm not a big fan of movies where people are like, oh, we're just having a fun time or whatever. You know, where it's like, it's just a dumb action movie. I'm not really a huge fan of those, but Redline is like the exception to me. That it's so good that if you're if you're interested in animation whatsoever, or even more, if you're not interested in animation whatsoever, and you need to see why people love animation, you need to watch Redline. It is fantastic. I'm gonna recommend Giver, old anime that I like, but I'd, I'd probably read the manga as well, just because the the anime leaves off on a cliffhanger ending. There there was a live action American movie of it. There were actually two, I think, and they're they're not very good. They don't convey the dark tone of the original, and they they just feel like dumb Power Rangers movies. I'm going to recommend School Days again, either the visual novel or the anime. I would say watch the anime first, probably, and then play the visual novel. I'm going to recommend Hajime no Ippo, which is a boxing anime that I have been watching pretty often for the past few months, and I'm really loving it. It's making me interested in watching Aishita no Jo because I heard that was really good too. And that's another boxing anime. It's just, a, it's a bit older. It's from the 70s, but I heard it's great. But it's not probably not going to be for everybody, I'd say for Aishita no Jo. So I'm going to recommend Hajime no Ippo because it's it's a madhouse production from like the late 2000s or like the, 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 the late 90s, early 2000s. I'm going to recommend Gurren Lagann, of course, duh. Uh, I've already gone into detail on the previous things about why I love it so much. I'm going to recommend Great Teacher Onizuka. That is a fantastic manga series and a fantastic anime. And I love it. You can use Onizuka's face for reaction images until the end of time. It, it's wonderful. I'm going to recommend the anime Golden Boy. Not the manga, but the anime. Uh, I feel like the OVA of Golden Boy is better than the manga because the manga gets a little too raunchy for my taste. Like, I like raunchy stuff. I mean, <laughs> I draw porn. It made Kintaro a little less charming compared to the OVA series where I feel like he's really, really charming and really funny. And I really like him. I'm going to recommend some games now. Yeah, play Lisa the Painful, and then after you play Lisa the Painful, play Lisa the Joyful. Fantastic music, fantastic art. It's funny as hell. It's depressing as hell. It's beautiful. PlayStation 2 release of Silent Hill 2. I know that there is a remake coming out, but hear me out. I have a feeling the original is going to be better anyways. I'm going to buy the remake regardless because Silent Hill 2 is my favorite game of all time. It's got the, the best narrative ever, but I don't trust Team Bloober entirely because they have pretty shit track record when it comes to, you know, games in the past, when it comes to like horror games and like the writing and they've never done combat before. And this is a game with combat. Uh, so if they fuck it up. I'm going to know. So play the original version of Silent Hill. Well, not the original version, but like play the original Silent Hill 2. Uh, there's an easy way to play a version on PC that is really easy to patch. And there's a lot of there's a comprehensive list of ways to patch it to where it's playable. If you're going to play the PlayStation version, play the greatest hits version. That's also known as director's cut in Europe. But that version has content from the Xbox port that's not in the very original that I think is really good. And it's just, it's a better value. Or you could play the Xbox port. It's pretty great too. Uh, but I think Director's Cut has a few more endings. 
the the Xbox version and director's cut slash greatest hits, those have a side campaign that is highly recommended, but you play it after you've beaten the main story. I'm going to recommend Persona 3. The portable version of the game is getting released very soon. Releasing on January 19th, 2023. I prefer FES because of a few things, but portable is still a great way to get into the franchise. I think it's a better way to get into the franchise than five. At least in my opinion. I'm heavily biased though. <laughs> Persona 4 Golden is also a fantastic game. I do prefer aspects of the original release of Persona 4 for PlayStation 2 as opposed to Golden. But Golden is still just a better game overall for certain aspects. Like it's got better balancing in certain things. It's by no means perfect. And there are certain aspects of Golden that were added that I don't like. But I still love Golden. I've still played it literally like fucking 10 times over the years. And it's it's great. That's like an 80 hour RPG. But because I played it on a, on a PlayStation Vita, I've been able to play it so many times. Played it a lot in college. When I went for like a year, <laughs> I'd play it in between classes and stuff. Most people have played Persona 5 by now, I think. If, if play Persona 5, beautiful game. I'm actually going to recommend Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. That game is great. I love it. Next, I'm going to recommend two games because they're a duology that have to be played together. Digital Devil Saga and Digital Devil Saga 2. I'll go ahead and say it. The, the first game ends on a cliffhanger that is resolved in two. Uh, so that's why I recommend playing both of them to get the full plot, obviously. They're fantastic RPGs, really dark themes. And by dark, I don't mean like, oh, people die. I, I, I mean, like, actually thought-provoking. In terms of fighting games, I'm going to recommend Guilty Gear Exerd Rev 2. I guess I'll recommend Waku Waku 7 because uh, it's a small fighting game. You can play it for free on Fightcade. And I know a lot of people that love it. And it's great. And really overlooked. Melty Blood. Either version of Melty Blood is fine. I prefer the older version in some aspects. And I prefer Type Lumina in other aspects. But both are great. Play Killer Instinct. 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 Saya no Uta is a visual novel. Do not buy the version on Steam. Buy the version on JustUSA.com. Very disturbing. Gin Urobuchi is an amazing writer. I will say, though, uh, if you can't handle dark shit, don't play it. In terms of manga, I'm going to recommend Bakuman. That's great. I'm going to recommend Helsing. I'm also going to recommend Helsing Ultimate. That's also great, but the that, that's an OVA. Re read Helsing. Read Berserk. Please read Berserk. Please read Berserk. Please read Berserk. This is going to be a little bit of a weird one. Last Boss. Not Last Boss. Last Boss. It's really weird. Like, it's not great. I, I guess I wouldn't say really good. It's it's experimental, and I, I appreciate that about it. Read the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure manga. Yes, the, the anime is gorgeous and beautiful and great, and I love it. But read the manga. Specifically, do not read the color scans. Read the black and white version because the black and white version has so much more detail and the color scans are not colored by Araki. They're colored by just some random guys at Shueisha because the color scans are made as a bonus for like a digital purchase of the, uh, of the manga through Shueisha's service or whatever in Japan. So don't read the color scans. Read the black and white versions first. Because they're great, and the color scans get certain aspects wrong. Like, Jotaro is supposed to have green eyes, as described in Part 3. But in the Part 3 color scans, his eyes are blue. That's wrong. There are multiple things like that, where there are just weird errors in the part, in, in the parts of the color scan. that are just wrong and contradictory to information we know. Read the black and white. 
Welcome to the NHK. That's a great light novel series and a great anime. I could honestly go on and on and on about recommendations. In, in terms of music, listen to Below Ground, one word, Below Ground. Listen to Uh-Oh Slater, also all one word. Listen to Negative XP. Look, look into that whole genre of music. It's great. It's fantastic. How to make friends. That's a difficult one because it varies from person to person. But I think one of the greatest ways to make friends is just to find something you guys have in common. Whether it be like a hobby or like life experiences you've had. Personally, I think hobbies are a bit easier to make friends over. So like if you're dumb like me and, and play card games where you uh, <laughs> waste waste money, you can make friends that way. Or if you play video games and waste money, you can make friends that way. Or if you draw, try and make some artistic friends. And and if, if you're really lucky, maybe you make some autistic friends as well, because those 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 guys are great. The the best way to just make friends is just to find that one thing you guys have in common. I have like way too many friends to be fair, uh like that I've made through like my decade of an online presence. To the point where it's like, uh, I, I sometimes forget like, oh yeah, I, I haven't talked to this guy in like two years. So uh, that's that's the state I'm in. So I'd say try and try and be kind and find people that also have similar interests. Don't be too kind. Don't be a pushover. And also... Keep your friends list manageable. <laughs> Don't be like me. I'm a bad example because I'm. I know a lot of people and I like to know them all a lot better, but I don't have enough time in the world to know them all as thoroughly as I can. And that that that's one thing that I don't really like about having so many people that I've met over time. It makes getting to know them on a more personal, deep level a lot harder if anything i'd say have a few very good strong friends and you don't have to worry about too many others you know just have those few that you know will stick by you i forget how i met hanzo i met him through twitter i don't remember much else i was browsing like japanese twitter or something and i saw his thing pop up and then he followed me and i followed him or whatever and we just kind of started talking and we've talked here and there and exchanged stories, you know, about like, oh, this is what I've been doing in Japan. This is what I've been doing in America. And that that's kind of how that's been going. But again, I've been talking to that dude for like 10 years now. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool because that guy's that guy's hobby is learning languages. And that guy knows way too many languages. He knows like he knows English really well. Uh, there are certain things that he still doesn't quite get. But he's better at English than I am at Japanese, while also studying Chinese and Spanish and Italian. He's awesome. Crisp Rat. Uh, so there's an artist called Rebecca Doodles. She has a Discord. I've been, you know, I'm semi-active on rare occasions in there, and I fuck around. I met Crisp in there where he was doing stupid shit in VC. And at the time I was a regular, or I was semi-regular on uh, streaming into the ethernet. And I was like, hey man, you want to be on this stupid podcast full of retards? And he's like, sure dude. And then we had him on and he was great. But it, <laughs> the funny thing is we we made a whole episode of just waiting for him and even just that episode of waiting for the guy to enter vc it is probably one of the highlights of any of the episodes i'd say at least it's it's one of my favorite episodes of just waiting for chris and then he finally shows up i think alex did an amazing job on editing that he's really great at editing so shout out to my buddy alex 
uh, flapstick underscore 101 on Twitter. Just got out of Twitter jail. As for how I met Alistair, there is a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure cartoon that I was working on. And I was looking for someone to do the voice of Smokey from part two. I had a couple guys, I made a forum post on Newgrounds, but like, hey, I'm looking for a guy to do the voice of Smokey. I, I got some some entries, but like the the other guys, they're I don't want to be rude. It's just that their audio quality wasn't quite there and their voice wasn't what I was looking for. And that's understandable. They were lesser known guys trying to get noticed. And I, I'm in that same situation. I'm a lesser known guy trying to get noticed. But I also have a par of quality, as surprising as that is, despite the garbage I put out, such as Boner Simpson and Here's Johnny coming out of a vagina. Dumb bullshit. Da quag. If you've if you checked out my new grounds, da quag. Uh, I still have a par of quality, even behind like my dumb bullshit shit posts. Alistair had the best audition, and so I got to work with him on that. I still need to finish the animation. I'm just, I'm really dumb. You know, after that, I've I've kind of been working on like YouTube stuff as well, and it just kind of worked out where I just kept talking to the guy, and he he's been helping me with my pipeline and all that, and figuring things out, uh, understanding the content creation process a bit better because I'm kind of sporadic and stupid, and I don't follow processes very well unless I'm giving specific step by step instructions, and I think that's because of my ADHD or whatever. But uh, yeah. He's been great. Alistair's dope. Shout out to you, Al. No, you're the asshole asking me these questions and editing this. Let's see. As for uh, the guys on the Gooner Gang, Matthew and Alex. Sometime in August, I went to a tech company to apply, like a uh, an IT company, a local place. And, I, you know, I, I gave them my stuff and blah, 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 here, here's my application. I didn't know what the fuck to do after that. I was like, okay, I got nothing better to do. I'm in town. Uh, I'm tired of being alone and having no friends. Because at the time, my buddy Justin uh, and I uh, weren't talking. And I didn't have any friends in town. I went to the local card shop. I made friends with people and things just kind of worked out. I met Matthew and his shitposting ass. I met Alex. Alex and I have uh, have similar mindsets when it comes to making stupid bullshit and doing dumb creative shit. <laughs> that's That's led us into a I, I think what's going to be a very fruitful working relationship when it comes to uh, making dumb bullshit. There's a musical project that we're we're kind of working. We're we're working on that game together, along with another friend of mine who secretive and likes his privacy. So I'm not going to mention his name, but he knows who he is. He's a great guy. I I love that absolute math spaz, but um. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it like this there's a project for Alex and I called slurp these testes I kind of want it to be a surprise expect that at some point the recipe for negative mental health is going on social media and looking at all the bullshit and seeing all the stupid shit that people post on Twitter and TikTok and stuff I don't have TikTok because uh I don't like the Chinese government spying on me. I don't like the American government spying on me, and I'm an American citizen. But I really don't like the Chinese government spying on me. One thing I'd say to never do is go on TikTok. Only use Twitter when you have to. I've been trying to use it less, but I still end up scrolling and shit. 
just because I'm trying to get a presence out there. I would say for sure, try to avoid avoid that shit. You know, you know when I when I really want my 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 mind to be in a positive place, I just I watch I watch some 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 really really nice videos on YouTube that make me that make me happy. That you know, I love all this positivity and all that. You know, people that are really positive have never been negative behind the scenes or anything. I love I love watching Mr. Beast videos and I love watching the guys give give a homeless man a hundred dollars. No, I fuck that. Um. I hate that feel good content shit. It's garbage and worthless. It's just trying to make people feel good and has no artistic integrity whatsoever and doesn't do fucking shit. Like Mr. Beast could actually like a decent person or whatever, but like, fuck. <laughs> in terms of in terms of uh, positive mental health, I'd say, unironically, go outside, meet people, make friends in real life that you can talk to in person. I would say work out. Uh, I need to do that more. This is going to sound weird. Find a buddy that doesn't mind getting hit and doesn't mind hitting you. Get into like, you know, friendly friendly boxing matches or fist fights or whatever. You know, so they'll let out a lot of energy. Set some ground rules, obviously, but like, I I find that fighting is a good way to. Like fighting out a positive context is a good way to let out negative energy and let in positive energy. I think combat sports are good. What are some things to avoid? Don't do heroin. Kind of at a disadvantage if you're in Scotland. I'd say avoid e thoughts for sure. Avoid people that want to use you and don't want to actually know you or whatever try to find sincerity within people and even though it's really hard to find people that are actually sincere uh, it's really easy to tell people that aren't sincere because they'll talk about how genuine they are and shit like that on social media anything that lists itself as an audiophile piece of equipment because it's it's probably just a scam go through like actual instrument shops and shit like that, like Sweetwater or whatever. Uh, this is a pretty open question of just things to avoid. So I'm just going to keep going on and just random shit to avoid. I'm going to say avoid EA games. They're always going to be buggy pieces of trash. And if you buy them, you are a fucking idiot. If you ever buy them on release. If you ever buy a sports game, listen, listen, dude. No one gives a shit. Don't buy, don't buy fucking Madden. Get NFL Blitz. Get Madden 08, and then you're good. Get the one that's really good that everyone agrees is good. You don't have to get the new one every year where it's just a fucking piece of shit that you know tries to rip you off every goddamn second that you play the game. Corn syrup. I'm real bad at that because I like drinking barbecue sauce. But you know, avoid corn syrup. I'm sorry, man, like, avoid it, but like, I like my sweet baby raised, but avoid it. Avoid TikTok. Yeah, avoid TikTok, uh, avoid Twitter, avoid Tumblr, avoid Facebook. They're all terrible and evil and, and make you lose faith in humanity. Also, avoid incoming traffic. Strategies you have developed to sleep and your history with sleep. My strategy I've developed to sleep is called drinking alcohol until I get a little tired and then I sleep kind of in and out throughout the night, but like at least I get sleep. That's what I did last night. I just got myself like a big ass can of fucking Mike's Harder and just drank that shit down and, and then I kind of got some sleep. My history with sleep is this. Uh, when I was a little wee baby, I had colic which is like a stomach thing that sometimes babies get. And uh, it made it where I always had a big tummy ache and I would cry my head off, apparently. Uh, my mom and dad would do shit like rock me in a rocking chair to get me to go to sleep. And then I'd fall asleep and then they'd stop rocking me and set me down and then I'd cry and wake up or I'd wake up and cry. One of those two. I don't know which came first. I can't remember. Then they do shit like put me on top of the washing machine or put me on top of the dryer to try and soothe my stomach. 
uh, and that never worked. Oh, I mean, that worked, but like, uh, at, for like the first six months of my life, I had colic. And when it finally went away, I think still to this day, it's affected me where I just don't sleep like at all. I can't sleep at normal human hours without some sort of like pill or some sort of alcohol or whatever. I am a terrible insomniac. My brain, I cannot shut off my ability to think like my ability to think critically happens constantly. It's annoying. I can't stop. I can't turn off my brain. I won't stop thinking about different things at all times. I have no off switch for my brain. I never have. And so what happens is I ended up like being awake until like 8 a.m. throughout the night. And then I fall asleep at 8 a.m. And then I wake up at noon and then I go to work. And then the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. And it's uh, terrible and stupid, but uh, I'm dumb. And that's what happens to me. I've always had a terrible thing with sleep. My my dad worked second shift and he's always had terrible issues with sleep. My mom's dad works third shift at the mines, so uh yeah, but my my dad for sure has always had issues with sleep. I might have gotten that through him, maybe. I don't know if I have like a genetic disposition for insomnia or whatever. Yeah, sleeping doesn't work for me. I went through I, all of school, like all of school from the age of like six to the age of 18, getting like max six hours of sleep, average four to two hours of sleep. And that's that's how I lived my life. <laughs> Even when I didn't have like video games with a backlit screen or anything like that, I just couldn't sleep. I'd like get up, I'd turn on my light and I'd read a book and I'd still just not be able to sleep. Sleep is a thing that I, I love very much. And when I do sleep, I end up sleeping for like 12 hours uh, sometimes. But like most of the time, I just can't sleep. What makes you happy? Boobs, uh, boobies and butts, titties and butts. Now, a lot of things make me happy. A lot more things make me upset, but a lot of things do make me happy. Being able to talk to friends. The few times where people tell me what they like about my art instead of just saying, oh, it's good. Uh, that makes me genuinely happy because uh, if I'm just told my art's good, it's like, okay, that, that's empty. That, that doesn't say anything. You aren't, you're just saying it looks good. And like, I get it, but. I like it when someone can be constructive. That's when it's really meaningful to me. Is when can, someone can be meaningful about what I've made and say, oh, the composition here is good. Or, hey, the color choices are very nice. And it's got a good palette, you know, things like that. I also like it when I, it also makes me happy when people tell me what to improve on with my art or whatever I make. Like, hey, uh, you should work on this part of anatomy or, hey, work on your posing to make it more dynamic or this. Because then I have an understanding that this is what I need to work on and then I can work on that and improve that and hopefully get better. I don't like people that ask for criticism and by criticism they mean unabashed praise. That's fucking stupid. You're a fucking idiot. If you're asking for criticism, you are asking... What can I improve on? Not what did I do well? That's that's my opinion. I like when people can be critical of my work in a constructive manner and not just be like, it's bad. Uh, I, I've had like one guy that did that and I said, okay, you say my art's bad, but like, you know, I also think that Jackson Pollock isn't very good as an artist either. And that guy's work sells for millions. So I don't know what to tell you, man. When I hear good music, when I when I find like new music that's really good, I've been listening to a lot of negative XP, uh, O Slater, With Love, Mom, Below Ground. Finding all that music out has been really, really nice and has made me pretty happy. Finding all that that whole section of music, I like it a lot. 
Let's see, what else makes me happy? Oh yeah, uh, playing Silent Hill. Uh, it's a depressing game when I play Silent Hill 2, but it's also a game that makes me extremely happy because uh, I find unabashed joy in that game for some reason because my brain no work too good. Finding new games that are interesting. It also makes me happy when I can find a new game that I think will be interesting to watch, not just to play. So if there's like a game I find and it's like, oh, this this game looks fun from like a gameplay perspective, but it also looks fun to watch or like I can put a spin on this to make a bad game fun. That's what I like. That, that makes me happy. I've been genuinely pretty happy doing the streaming with Gooner Gang again, and it's made me want to do more streaming on my own personal channel. Another thing that makes me happy, this is this is kind of embarrassing, but reading good romance manga makes me happy. Um that that improves my mood so that way I can uh vicariously experience uh a nice beautiful romance because that's something I'm just not allowed to have apparently. <laughs> um so at least getting to experience it through characters that that makes me happy e even though I'm not allowed to have that personally. What knowledge and skills do you use on a daily basis? Okay, so my brain is kind of retarded and decided, hey, I'm going to like absorb everything, but not all of it. But like I'm going to absorb everything and then I'm just going to like forget random parts of it. I'd say the most important skill that I've learned is critical thought. But as I said in the uh, sleep question, it also has ruined me horribly because my brain does not shut off. Something else I also use on a daily basis would just be my general knowledge with computers because I've been using computers since I can remember. I have a pretty good memory. And from the first time that I can actually like remember using the computer was like, I think it was about maybe one and a half to two years old. And I was like playing computer games. Yeah, you know, more and more I, I've understood things when it comes to electronics to the point where like I operated cameras at one point when I was 13 for a church I went to until like I was 18. I've done camera work for a local news station back when I was in high school when they needed somebody to fill in and they're like looking for students that knew how to do camera shit. I guess I also use my knowledge of OBS pretty often because I use that weekly for Gooner Gang. Though I'm always finding new and interesting ways to use OBS and new plugins and stuff. So that's that's still a learning process for me. I also keep learning more and more about like figuring out bit rates and shit like that and getting that to work. The skills and knowledge I use varies day to day depending on what task I have. Well, my history with YouTube is quite a bit longer than my history with streaming as a viewer, at least. Uh, as a viewer, I've been watching YouTube since I would say 2010 regularly, but like I'd see it now and then sometimes or before that. My first video I ever saw on YouTube, my my childhood friend Christian showed me a f clip of Brian Griffin in the banana suit doing the peanut butter jelly time dance in 2005 and that's that's the first YouTube video I ever saw and I didn't laugh and I was like okay this this is a thing and yeah <laughs> that was my first experience with YouTube but then in 2010 I got my first smartphone and I started actually using YouTube and watching it through the app and all that. I guess actually in middle school, I started watching YouTube a bit through like the uh, Nintendo Wii internet browser. I watched like Angry Video Game Nerd. In high school, I would start watching it through my smartphone and I'd watch like, uh, oh, I'd watch, you know, Angry Video Game Nerd. I'd watch... A lot of game reviewers like Peanut Butter Gamer, Pro Jared, 
Uh, I'd watch the hell out of Screw Attack. I'd, I'd keep up weekly with the Screw Attack news. Yeah, I mostly just watched gaming stuff. And then later, my buddy Corey, uh, like I said before, told me about Newgrounds. And then I discovered, yo, some of these Newgrounds guys also upload to YouTube. And so I started finding more and more animators on YouTube. And I'd been planning on making a YouTube channel for a while. Like, I have a YouTube channel that I've had for forever, but I never really made content for it. I didn't start making content for YouTube until recently, but I've been planning it since at least 2012. Didn't really have a computer of my own, though, so I couldn't really do any video editing or anything, especially because the, com the family computer was a piece of garbage. And I didn't know how to get the software that I needed. So I just didn't do anything with it. I'd consider doing it more and more as time went on. But it wasn't really until 2022 um, that I actually made content for YouTube that wasn't just like me uploading clips of gameplay or whatever. And while it's an interesting process, um, I, I definitely need to improve my process. I need to improve my ability to focus on things a lot more for sure. I, I kind of came into YouTube at a really shit time too. I wish I'd gotten into the game around like 2015 or so now. That would have been way better because because now it's just garbage. It's it's so shit. God, I, I fucking hate YouTube so much. Be, like the company. I like the site. I hate the company so much. My experience with streaming, I've been streaming since 2014 on my corrosive Twitch channel. It went by a different name at the time. Uh, I actually started with a channel called Xylith. That's the one I had since 2014. However, Twitch had a little fucky wucky. They, uh, they had a hack. I lost access to that account after that hack. So I created a new one uh, under a similar name, uh, Xylith, whatever. After a while, I ended up changing that name to Corrosive when I changed everything to Corrosive in about 2021, I'd say. Yeah, 2021 is when I started going by, I went by Corrosion with like an X-I-U-N. -X and then I changed that to Corrosive because... Uh, Corrosive is just easier for people to spell and all that. It's easier. So I've been doing the streaming thing for, for a long time. I hit affiliate with Twitch on my personal channel back in 2018. That was after a, a lot of a lot of hard work streaming and buying better equipment and stuff. Unfortunately, I I started having issues with Twitch as well as a company and uh, as a website, both. It, as it gave more into the IRL streaming, it became less and less interesting to me as a website as opposed to when it was about gaming and art. And while I know I could stream on Picarto to stream art, Twitch is the one where I, like, I can actually make money through it. And I want to be able to make money through my work and through what I do. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit harder now to stream for a multitude of reasons. Especially since uh, af after losing a previous job, I had to move back in with my parents. And that, that sucks. But ever since I've been doing the Gooner Gang stuff, I've been having a lot of fun with streaming because I'm streaming with other people and I'm, I'm having an entertaining time with my friends. I like, to, uh, I like to get us to affiliate. I like to get us to be bigger than affiliate. I like us to partner someday even. That'd be great. Uh, it'd be great if we could get ourselves to a, a higher point on you know, Twitch's rankings or whatever because... Um, I'd like to get to a point where we can go to a place that has better internet than the record store. Oh my lord, that record store's internet is trash, dude. Oh man, like the bit, video bit rate is garbo. And that's why the video ends up looking like absolute dog water uh, in the recordings, unfortunately. 
So yeah, we're gonna try and uh, try and expand, try and do better, and then maybe if we get to a point where we're making enough through like sponsors or subscribers or something, we can we can get to a better place of our own to stream from. But right now, it's just uh, it's just not very. It's not viable currently since we're still not even affiliate yet. But uh, yeah, I've been I've been having a lot of fun with that. So if you want to join us and you want to help us get to that point where we can make some good content to keep you guys entertained, go to twitch.tv slash Gooner Gang Gamers. What makes a good media review? Give some examples of what you consider good and bad reviews. Use as much detail as you would like. So I think that there are, you know, a few types of reviews. There's the critical review. And then there's like the comedic review. What I think what I think makes a good comedic review is staying on point to the subject matter that you're reviewing, whether it be a game or a movie or music. Stay focused on that. Don't go off and do a bunch of random stupid skits. Uh, I hate that. I hate that stuff. If you want to do a skit show, do a skit show. You schizo. I, I'd rather just the comedy be about the media in question and pointing out its flaws and things like that. Uh, when it comes to an actually good critical review, I would say that... Um, I'm honestly going to say that like a good critical review just requires an understanding of media as a whole, like having good media literacy. So like if you want to be good at reviewing movies, you need to see the all time classics, you know, the ones that are considered critically acclaimed films before you can dissect the next film you, you know, you go see or whatever, and then you review it. If you don't see a movie that is critically acclaimed and then just make a review, a critical review. I mean, you can make something that's your opinion, but you might not understand the forefathers of the medium. Like, if you were to review Joker and you haven't seen Kings of Comedy or Taxi Driver, it's not going to bode well, in my opinion. You're going to like the movie, probably. I mean, I like the movie. If you're going to review something you need to you need to have a good understanding of everything now I, I think as a whole though with with games as well you need to play you need to play some important games and while games are way different than movies in terms of like your ability to enjoy them because like a movie it's just the story and visuals and the audio but with games you also have to include gameplay uh, and that that's a big aspect of that if it's not if it doesn't play well a story doesn't mean shit you know look at heavy rain or whatever i mean that, that game's got a shit story too but you know look at heavy rain if the if the story was amazing it would still be shit because the game is shit like the gameplay itself is garbage uh, i think a, a really good review of uh like like a good a good critical review would be uh reviews by Ben Yahtzee Croshaw, zero punctuation. Like he does, he adds a bit of comedy in there, but he understands the games of the past because he's played them. And so he's able to understand what a good game is and then, you know, judge games by a, a you know, a certain standard of quality that he, he deems as, as the par. I think with like a good, like comedic review. That's hard to find. I like I like some of the stuff by Angry Video Game Nerd. But I've just been watching his stuff for forever. I, I like season four pretty well. But I, I think that um some of the best ones are honestly by Pro Jared. I, I think he does a pretty good job with like his highlight videos and I'd say the Alone in the Dark video is pretty great. I think my one of my all time favorites might be his video on maybe yeah I'd, I'd, I'd say hide light for virtual hide light because like it's one that you watch after you've seen his hide, his other hide light videos and so they kind of build on top of each other 
and also he with his videos his comedic videos while he's doing like the angry gamer video the angry gamer review uh he always gives a good personal uh story behind some of the games that he's played if like they're really really bad like highlight or like beyond two world or like two worlds that's what it's called be uh, not beyond two worlds i'm thinking beyond two souls that's a that's another garbage game i watch cinema snob sometimes and that's pretty good but other than that, I, I just don't really watch too many movie reviews. I just kind of watch movies when I do watch them. I don't really watch too many movies, though, even. Though I, I really need to. I definitely also need to read a lot more books. Your main friend group is now obsessed with smoking salvia extract and vandalizing government property. What do you do? I join them in smoking the salvia. The go vandalizing government property, I don't join them in that. I tell them, hey guys, listen. I hate the government too. They fucking suck. Guess what you don't do? Vandalize their property. What you do instead, a studio has given you a budget of $100,000 to make an indie game in six months. What do you do? They are expecting you to turn a mild profit. $100,000 to make an indie game is a pretty good amount. I could make something pretty decent with some good people for about 100k. Six months is way too damn short. So what I'd probably do is make a shitty mobile game. With like, like an auto runner or like a gotcha game or something. I'd try to rush that out. And I'd put in microtransactions. And I'd make it free to play. And then I'd rake in all the money that I could. Because they're wanting a mild profit. They're wanting it in six months, and that's not enough time to make something great, in my opinion. Like, you can do some great stuff with an experienced team in, like, nine months. But six months? Listen, you're asking for E.T. for Atari 2600. That's, like, as much time as that guy was given to, to make the game. It was, like, six months. And, and that, was, that was one guy on his own. Uh, if you think a team can make something great in six months, like there are really good people at game jams and stuff, but if they want you to make a profit, that's a completely different subject. Make it a game for a game jam. You're just trying to make the best game, but putting profits on the line for a six months of development is not feasible. I would not be able to turn that profit, unfortunately more than likely I, I don't think i could i i could do my best if i again made a shitty mobile game with microtransactions and gotcha elements and stuff like that if they want an actual game like a real game and they want it to be good six months isn't enough time i'd need at least like a year a year and six months something like that all of a sudden you are suffering from major burnout and you must solve the issue. How? <sighs> Major burnout is an issue that I've, I've dealt with in the past. I feel like I'm kind of dealing with it now a bit with art. Like sometimes it happens to me where I just, I don't want to draw. So what I do is I force myself anyways. And I'll just put on a podcast in the background or whatever. That's, that's what I do. If it's like major, major burnout. I don't know, like, go outside, go, go work out, do, go to a bar and drink with some friends, do something to, like, take your mind off of it, find a way where, like, you can give yourself a new perspective on things, think about why this is happening, do things in life that will give you inspiration, and then go and try to achieve what you envisioned. Create a plot to a visual novel that you would like to see and interact with. That, that's a hard one. I, I really like visual novels, but if I gave one that I'd like to see, I kind of want to make one. So I don't want to give too much out. But I'm already working on other stuff anyways. So I guess I'll go ahead and say I'd like to see a visual novel where the main character is ruthless they are like absolutely 
horrid the the level of violence they enact upon others as like a like as a fighter or whatever like let, let's say it's like a, a fantasy visual novel uh, i want to see one where like you know the the king says oh you know or not the king but like the the general says oh do this and then he beats him to hell and back or whatever and then like the the main character gets strong stronger and stronger and then eventually like the people that turn you know that like treat him like shit they, they just get driven into the ground like dust and uh he tortures them and shit <laughs> i mean it's dark and messed up but that's what i like about it, it it's interesting because every, everything else it's like oh i'm just gonna be namby pamby or whatever a lot of visual novel like i like i like visual novels but unless you're going for like the super weird shit like fucking maggot baits or goddamn euphoria main characters aren't typically that interesting it's always given more focus to the girls so i think that a visual novel that explores the mind of a psychopath of like an absolute sadist would be very interesting and i'd like to see that I'd also like it if uh, if it gave me the ability to uh, like show mercy on people or not. I don't know. It it'd be interesting to see like a, someone with. I, I'd like to see a double route where either you go along the lines of somebody who's like good, or you become someone who's an absolute monster. That would be interesting to have those choices in a visual novel. Uh, if it comes to that kind of story, I don't want any sexual content. I'm not going to lie. I just want to see some dude beat the shit out of people. How should major corporations handle intellectual properties and fan projects? Tough question. It's a tough situation. Personally, I think that if you are a major corporation, you should let fan projects slide if they are not for profit. If they are just a passion project, then it should be totally fine if they are making their own assets from scratch and they are making something new but it just so happens to use your character or your world that should be totally okay now if someone is using like textures you created or 3d models you made in something it's a little iffy then because they didn't make that that that's at a point where I'm like, uh, I'm not so sure. Maybe they should like, you know, kind of say, "Hey, we we appreciate that you like doing, you know, you like our thing, but please don't use our models, that, or please don't use our assets that we created." I would say that much. If it's something for profit, if someone was like trying to make money off of like a fan project, I would say that you should not make money. You shouldn't make money off of a fan project unless you get express permission from the creators. As long as they don't attack like fan art, that's fine. But like that's one of the reasons they don't do too much fan art is because if you do fan art, then people are going to you're always going to be under that possibility of being hit with a copyright strike. So I don't think fan works should be able to make money unless the creators give express permission uh, and it might be a little controversial but if you really want to make money through something i'm always of the mindset that you should be creative and make something of your own you should make something that's not derivative of something else at least it, you know at least not explicitly derivative you know literally every fantasy setting is basically just lord of the rings but they don't take place within the world of Lord of the Rings, if you get what I'm saying. Do you collect merchandise of various franchises? Yes. I collect... So I, I, I like to build Gunpla, which are Gundam model kits. I enjoy those. Uh, I have Amiibo of, of characters I like. Uh, I can't get a Joker 
Persona 5 Amiibo, which is unfortunate. They're, they're really hard to come by. But I do have Terry Bogard, and recently I picked up a Kazuya Mishima Amiibo. A while ago, I won a contest from Hobby Link Japan, and I got to choose my prize, and so I chose a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Giorno Giovanna action figure, and that's pretty cool. I have some Shin Megami Tensei and Persona posters. I have a Fatal Fury hat, which is kind of also a King of Fighters hat, because it's the one that Terry Bogard wears in King of Fighters, and also in Smash Bros. Two Megaton hats. One of them is from Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, and one of them is from Persona 5. But the Persona 5 one is kind of funny, because it says, Get Smoked. And so every time I wear that, people that don't know Persona 5 think I'm just a massive fan of weed. And like, weed is great and all, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pothead. So that's, uh, that's always fun to explain. No, no, it's not, it's not a weed thing. Uh, though it's funny because Alex thought it was a uh, Kumitai thing, a, a thing from a fighting game tournament. I'm like, nah, it's, it's not that either. It's Persona. I have a Getter Robo model kit that I really like. I'm trying to think of what else I have in particular. I have a couple special editions of games. Other than that, like I don't really collect anything from... I don't really collect too many things. Like I don't have a bunch of statues. I just have like a... I think maybe 10 Gunpla, a few Amiibo, and then like some shirts and stuff. Though I'd really like to start making my own shit like my own shirts and all that i have a few up on various websites but i need to make more and i, I want to see i want to see like a statue of a character that i made you know be produced i want to see like a xylith statue or like my corrosive avatar be a statue or something that'd be cool that'd be really cool so yeah most of my most of my collection is is Gundam and Megami Tensei. So like Shin Megami Tensei and Persona. Okay, so my question for myself now that I've thought about it is, hey, Koro, what is the game you're working on going to play like? What kind of atmosphere is it going to be? Uh, so <laughs> my answer to my own question for that game I'm working on with uh, Alex and another friend of mine I know in real life it's going to be a game that plays like a link to the past, but it's going to have the atmosphere of Silent Hill. You know, just for fun, I'm going to give myself another question. How do you like, uh, what's your favorite food? I have a lot of foods I like, but my one of my favorites is a New York strip cooked rare. I like the juiciness of it. Don't. Add steak sauce to your steak if it's a good steak. Try not to worry too much about the opinions of others. I would say worry more about your own convictions. Uh, people will follow you if you show strong conviction and if you prove that you are true to yourself and true to your own ideals. Because the moment that you show that you are not honest with your thoughts that you put out in public and the persona you put on, if that persona of yours is nothing like the real you, then you are going to suffer for it. Uh, there, there are countless examples of it. But yeah, you should uh, try to be true to yourself. And while I think that for public purposes, you should not let your actual self be out there. Make sure that things that you do and say don't contradict with what others think you um, you stand for. A group, this is a hypothetical, I guess, technically. A group of trolls are trying to make you into a lol cow. They are relatively harmless, harmless archiving what you are doing, discussing what you do on forums, making mean-spirited memes, etc. How should they be handled? 
Alistair is upset because he thinks he it is his fault. They also religiously watch Gooner Gang Gamers, parentheses, 10 regular viewers, max 75, close parentheses. They make all types of different comments, some good, some bad. Alex takes some of the comments very personally and lashes out and breaks one controller. I would become a lol cow. I'm not much of one right now, but I would become one. If they if they started archiving me and stuff, I would feed the fucking trolls. I would make the trolls you know, watch my shit. I, Alex, Alex actually uh, was one of the OGs when it came to cr- uh, trolling and chronicling tr- uh, Chris Chan back in the day, back forever ago. So uh, he would probably also lean into it because... He's not the kind of guy to break a controller. Actually, on a, an episode of Gooner Gang, we were talking about how we hate people that break controllers and throw controllers and shit, like they're a bunch of children. So what we'd probably end up doing is is buying an already busted controller that's beyond repair, or like just buy a shell or something and fake break a controller. We we do something to make the trolls basically make us money. We would not... <laughs> we would... We would not be able to like we we would manipulate them. That's how I'll put it. We would manipulate them in such a way that they were making us money. Because that's that's the best way to handle trolls is to manipulate them. That's my that's that's some more advice for people. If someone's trolling you, lean into it. Lean into it hard and then and then profit off of them. Start live streaming if people troll you, and then start acting fake enraged when people say shit to you, and make money off of those fuckwads. Fuck you, uh, Alistair. I'm gonna I'm gonna read this out loud at the conclusion. Please say something like, "I don't believe everybody can be an artist because I know everyone already is, and they're always will, and they always will be. You always will be anything inspirational that you believe in." I'm gonna read that part out loud because fuck you. No matter how much you feel the world may be against you, fight. Fight as hard as you can. Grit your teeth, claw and bite back. Never relent. Never let the world tell you no. Always fight back. Always show that you are stronger. Always show that you are relentless and that you will make it. Never give in, ever. Whether it be depression, whether it be finding, you know, having a shitty job, Fight back hard. Show that you will not give up. Show that you cannot be tamed. Show that you will not submit. Make the world submit to you instead.